In my last installment in this series, I covered the dark period of the Reed Hotel that once stood at Southwest 4th and Salmon in downtown Portland. And as far as this next installment, we aren't moving that far away. This is the Lotus, or the Lotus Hotel, or the Lotus Card Room, or the Lotus Cafe. Look at it. Not much to look at, right? I can't imagine when this building first opened as the cheap Albion Hotel in 1906 that its creators had any idea the intrigue and often strange history that would engulf this place over its 112-year existence. In July 2018, the beloved, if not gorgeous, Lotus was reduced to ashes, and I made sure to be there to watch it. During this time, I didn't know a lot about this place and its sordid history. It was demolished, along with another of my favorites in the city, the Ancient Order of United Workmen Temple, to make way for new, ugly architecture. So saith this Facebook post I made at the time. The temple went down slow, and the new hotel in its place went up fast. The plan for the Lotus site was a combination office building and hotel. As far as I'm concerned, there was some sketchy practices going on in this case, but as is often the case, the demolishers won. As quickly as was allowed, the Lotus disappeared forever. And yet, if you return to this site today, in 2023, you may notice something interesting. The site remains empty. No office, no hotel. It appears the plans for this site ran into some problems. It's sad when the desires to get rid of old structures is so strong that it's done before the replacement project is fully ready to go. Because if it was, there'd be a fucking building here right now. But there's not. And all we have for the time being is the shell of what would have been the Lotus's reportedly haunted basement, with a few tunnels leading out to the sidewalks. And I'm sure this is where I'll get some blah, 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 unreinforced structure, blah, blah, blah. It's just a building, blah, blah, blah. Who cares, blah, blah, blah. Well, lots of people care, moron. And if you don't, that's fine. You don't speak for the rest of the world, dude. The last time this spot was empty was 1906. It was the year after the Lewis and Clark Exposition, and the city of Portland was at the beginning of a population explosion, an explosion that led to a hotel boom that went on through the 1910s, and the 1906 Albion was one of the earliest structures made during that boom. Like many, it was a modest three-story brick structure that once had a cornice going around it. White staining in the decades after, remained as a reminder of this. And, of course, there was commercial space on the ground floor. I'm not sure exactly what existed here in those early days, but historical documentation suggests it was retail space, or, oddly enough, possibly factory space? Somehow I doubt that. Those early years of the Albion were not exactly a picture of hotel elegance. What could you really expect from a place offering $7 a month rooms? Most stories I found related to it pre-1924, of which there were few, paint a rather depressing picture of the place. Many were health notices, such as a Mrs. Ishmael who was very ill and staying at the Albion. 
a J. Isage who was dying of tuberculosis while staying there, and a Margaret McGinnis who died in her room there, believed due to her alcoholism. And honestly, she probably wasn't the only one to die that way at the Lotus. But perhaps the most disturbing story I heard came from 1914 when a local bookstore owner, L. W. Highland, was found dead in his room. It was reported he died of a hemorrhage of the lungs, which I didn't even know was a thing. And then there were guys like H. C. Marston, downtrodden enough to be staying at the Albion in 1913, but lucky enough to be carrying $50 in gold on him. So what did he do? He drank himself into a stupor in his room before going missing. He was later found on the steps of the county courthouse, two blocks away, babbling that a highwayman had attacked and robbed him of his gold. You know, now that I think about it, I doubt this guy had any gold in the first place. On February 16th, 1927, 41 patrons of the hotel had to be evacuated when a fire broke out in the basement of the building, causing damage to the spaces on the first floor. It's believed the fire was caused by sparks from the furnace, striking some nearby kindling. According to an interview with a Harold Onishi about his Japanese family's experience in Portland, he noted that his family ran and operated the Lotus Hotel at the start of the 1940s, and it appears in the years before that, other persons of Japanese descent also ran this hotel, possibly back into the late 20s when this fire happened. In Onishi's story, he includes the tragic details of when his family was forced to relocate to internment camps during World War II. He even mentioned how they burned any items tying them to their native Japan in their stove in their room at that hotel to make it look like they had no loyalty to their native Japan when the authorities came. Despite being the peak of prohibition, the Lotus Cafe opened in 1924, functioning much like a soda shop and, let's be honest, probably sneaking booze to their patrons on the side. One website mentioned a booze bust at the Lotus back in 1927, of which the cafe's first owner, Peter Riken, denied any knowledge of. It's important to realize that while the city's known skid row was to the north around Burnside Street, there was another skid row in this area. The part of town surrounding the Lotus was known for its prostitution, bootlegging, and petty crime. Ex-cons were everywhere, as were transients. It should be of no surprise, then, that after the Lotus Cafe and Card Room opened, and the hotel upstairs was renamed The Lotus, that it was heavily rumored the hotel was secretly operating as a brothel, specifically a Depression-era brothel. With its close proximity to City Hall and the county courthouse just blocks away, the Lotus became a gathering spot for city officials and personnel from the mayor's office. Some of these people spent time in the Lotus's back bar, which, after the repeal of Prohibition in 1933, became a more exclusive spot, reserved for high-up government officials and the like. The rumor was that some of these individuals, when they were done at the bar, would go up a concealed stairwell to the hotel above and take advantage of its brothel-like benefits. While these are still rumors, I have a tendency to believe in them considering what the area was like back then, and I know for a fact that at least in later years, the hotel was being used by sex workers to turn tricks. But I'll get to that. A passage in Portland historian and writer Phil Stanford's book, Rose City Vice, noted that in 1911, of the 547 hotels, apartments, and rooming houses in the city, 431 of them were, quote, wholly given up to immorality. 
so it would be of no surprise to me that a little spot like the Albion slash Lotus Hotel would have had a little extra action going on. But for some of the secrets it may have held, the Lotus was not all dark. Its status as having a card room was heavily utilized, and the bar's clientele attracted a little of everyone, especially loggers. It was also a favored spot for shipyard workers during World War II, and its gorgeous bar had a bit of a history itself. Originally built in 1880 by the Chicago-based Brunswick Company, when the bar was moved to the West Coast, it was actually shipped all the way down and around South America before landing in a few other cities before finally becoming a staple of the Lotus in 1962. Upon its arrival, it reportedly had a bullet hole in it. When the Lotus closed down, the bar was saved and relocated to the McMinimans at the Baghdad Theater in Southeast Portland. During the Lotus Cafe's renaissance, so to speak, during the 40s and into the 50s, it not only drew lots of everyday workers, but was reportedly a spot where gangsters loved to hang out. On occasion, Big Jim Elkins would spend time there. Elkins was the closest thing the city of Portland ever had to a real true crime boss in the likes of a Carlos Marcello or a Sam Giancana. Granted, Elkins never came close to their level. He came to Portland in the late 1930s and in only a few short years he went from whorehouse proprietor to the city's head crime boss, mixed up in everything from bootlegging to prostitution to gambling to dealing drugs. But by the 1950s, Elkins got himself mixed up in some Teamster-related drama that went south fast. He would make the decision to go public with his crimes in order to protect himself, unveiling a web of citywide corruption so massive that it sparked a Senate investigation that would prove to be a massive embarrassment to the city and bring an end to Big Jim's crime boss days. But if he was spending time at the Lotus in those days, you can bet he wasn't just there for the atmosphere. One could say the rough elements never fully left the Lotus, at least until the 1990s. As the 50s faded into the 60s, crime in the vicinity of the Lotus grew once again, and the hotel upstairs never really shook its seedy reputation. By the 60s, it functioned like most Skid Row-esque hotels, with the most destitute of destitute living within its walls. And remember how I said earlier that prostitution was definitely going on at the Lotus in later years? Well, I primarily get this from a passage in the book Behind the Badge in River City by former Portland police officer and detective Don Dupay, which I highly recommend and have personally read twice. In this passage, he discusses apprehending a sex worker while he worked on the Vice Squad back in the 60s. He described being picked up by a bony woman, clearly on drugs, and going back to her room on the second floor of the Lotus. He discusses the rickety staircase going up, the windows covered with grime, the stench of booze and urine in the hallway, and the filthy room they went into with drug paraphernalia scattered around. He even mentioned how the front desk person paid them no attention as they entered indicating he knew full well the space upstairs was being used for sex work. It wasn't exactly a rarity in places like this at that time. And in 1968, even a case of murder would be connected to the Lotus. On April 25th of that year, a local boxer and pimp named Carlos Mendoza would be found shot to death in a stolen car out near the Portland International Airport. It was learned that a few days earlier, on the 20th, Mendoza had brutally beaten up a sex worker named Donna Chadwick. Chadwick was one of Michael Wright's girls, 
and Michael Wright's stepdad was local crime thug Vince Capitan, known in crime circles as the Iceman. When Chadwick told Wright what had happened, he grabbed a gun and left, saying he was going to kill Mendoza. It's believed Mendoza was tricked into thinking he was going out to rob a pharmacy and was picked up by someone in a stolen 1956 Chevy. They were followed by Wright in another car to the kill site where they left Mendoza in the stolen car and left in the car Wright was driving. Capitan would serve 10 years in connection with this crime and after going on the run as far away as New Orleans, Michael Wright was finally caught and sentenced to life for his involvement. Strangely enough, he would be paroled after two years on the insistence of the presiding judge and prosecutor. Nothing sketchy there. Wright would go on to run the needlessly controversial Cindy's Bookstore in Chinatown before being forced to close it down, and when the building was demoed, he opened up the land to the city's homeless. He has since stated that he's left his criminal life behind him. However, this murder case is only tied to the Lotus as a possible motive for the killing. It's also thought Mendoza was cooperating with authorities in a larceny case against Wright, which may have been the actual motive for killing him. Regardless, exactly a decade later, a murder would happen within the Lotus itself. On October 28, 1978, a bar patron, Thomas Lapari, had the cops called on him by bartender Cletus Mitz after having a verbal altercation with another customer. According to Lapari, he was then roughed up by police who reported to the scene as Mitz was spewing expletives at him. Vengeful, he later returned to the Lotus and gunned down Mitz in cold blood. After going away to prison, Lapari would be released in 1987, at which time he had found Jesus, like they all do. The 70s were certainly a rough time for the Lotus, at least the hotel, which had just evolved further into a status as a true flop house. Most who stayed there were alcoholics or elderly men, some of which had probably relocated there in the aftermath of the city's massive South Auditorium urban renewal project, which leveled several blocks on the southern end of downtown. This displaced several elderly men living in the rundown hotels of that area. During these projects, the Lotus was barely spared, and even in the mid-70s, there was talk of demolishing the place for the sake of progress and a newer, better Portland. This came one step closer to becoming a reality in 1976 when, against extensive backlash, the hotel was closed down for not being brought up to code. The city had become fiercely strict on old hotels following the rules in the aftermath of the Pomona Hotel fire that killed a dozen people in the summer of 1975. It was believed many of these victims died simply because there were no fire doors in the building, something that had recently become a requirement. After the hotel's closure in 76, I'm not sure exactly how much those upper floors were used. When I first saw it in person in 2016, it was clear those floors had been vacant for a while. The bar remained just another spot for people to go until it was purchased in 1990 by John Plew, who took advantage of the place's divey appearance and converted the old card room into more of a nightclub space. Eventually, it became a pretty hip night spot. Local politicians, including mayors, began hanging out there again, and even the odd celebrity. According to Plu, Madonna showed up one night, and even Daryl Hall and John Oates came in after a show. George Clinton also showed up one night and got so drunk that he vomited in the restroom, sparking a heartfelt apology the following day. It ain't always glitz and glamour. And speaking of glamour, 
the Lotus has a few connections to the silver screen. While Madonna popped into the Lotus one night, she also filmed some scenes for the 1992 film Body of Evidence there, but they were deleted from the final production. While shooting the 1988 film Drugstore Cowboy, Gus Van Sant and Matt Dillon were frequently seen at the Lotus. And the Lotus also served as a significant backdrop in the hard-to-hate film from 1993 called Brain Smasher, starring Andrew Dice Clay and Terry Hatcher. In the film, a bouncer, played by Clay, lived in the run-down Lotus Hotel, and in it, we can actually see interiors of how the place looked during the 90s. It definitely still had some charm to it in its later years. Even up into the new millennium, and its final years leading up to the building's ultimate closure in 2016, the Lotus remained a fairly popular hotspot to dance and get a drink. Its closure definitely broke a lot of hearts, especially considering the fact that it appears now it was demolished for no reason. When the demolition crew finally arrived, I was there on two occasions, staying as long as I possibly could and capturing a video record of this iconic place's dying moments. Periodically, I was able to capture a glimpse through the rubble of what the interior looked like there at the end. And since that summer, some five years ago, we have been left with an empty basement hole at that corner on 3rd and Salmon. And while it's old hat now, when the rubble was cleared, unveiling these gorgeous brick-lined tunnels leading out of the basement area, everyone's imaginations, even mine for a moment, went wild with thoughts of the Shanghai tunnels in Old Town. Some have even tried to push the idea online that these are a continuation of those very tunnels, when, in reality, they're very short tunnels leading to freight elevators below the sidewalks. Just a relic from years past. But this hasn't stopped stories from spreading, suggesting the most infamous haunted story related to the Lotus, that being an angry spirit in the basement, is also related to Shanghai Tunnel lore because of the tunnels. It's been suggested victims to be shanghai were lured down into the basement and perhaps an intended victim died down there and now haunts the space. There are also several haunted elements tied to the hotel, such as mysterious footsteps, doors creaking, and a sense that something or someone is there with you. Honestly, this makes more sense, considering how many people probably died in that hotel over the years. Back in downtown along 3rd, I'm going to go back to the site, former site of the Lotus. I was there a couple months ago, but I just kind of breezed by, and these are all the park blocks through here, actually. Rest, Lounsdale Square restroom just a little bit that way. The Reed Hotel would have been just across the street from it. And the Lotus is right down here. Here we are. The site of history. At least history that once was. And it's still... Still just a, an empty lot next to the auditorium here with that for sale sign there. Which leads me to further think the project that was going to happen here um, has probably been cancelled. I found an article from like 2021, I think, that said it had been postponed. That may have been in relation to COVID. But the fact of the matter is they implied they were going to jump right on this project the moment that this building was gone. And here we are some five years later and it's still just empty. Oh, 
mostly wanted to come out here just to just to take a little bit to kind of show what's still here because there's still interesting aspects uh, left out here for people to see whatever that was over there but yeah you can see the brick That would have been, I'm assuming this would have been the wall down in the basement. I mean, the building was brick. Um, so yeah, you can see and there's pipes and whatnot here. Like there's still a little old piece of wood down there. That's probably, there's still bricks from the building. A little off in the distance there. Wish I could hop in there, but I don't want to take the risk. I don't know if I'd be able to get out. There's still bricks down in there. You can see the bricks lining here. And of course, the thing that attracts everybody's attention, which are these tunnels that some people have still tried to argue are connected to the Shanghai tunnels, which are many, 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 many blocks that way. And here's the hotel that replaced the uh, United um, or Workmen Temple. That went up real fast, so I assume the same would happen here. But yeah, you can stand here and look. And you can literally see from my angle. I don't know how well it shows up, but there's a wall there about 10, 12 feet back from the start of the tunnel. This tunnel goes nowhere. That tunnel. You can literally see the wall right there. That tunnel goes nowhere. These were used, like a lot of businesses, so that you could bring in, you know, inventory, things of that nature, in through the basement without dealing with all the drama up here on the street is a very common thing back in the day. And they use these freight elevators up on the sidewalk. Put the stuff on there, elevator goes down, you can bring it in here. But some people still wanna believe there's a Shanghai tunnel connection, but literally like right here, here's a tunnel. You get right to the other side of this, and what do we see? Oh, nothing. Well, this one's gone. Okay, well, that was a bust. But yeah, you saw, there was another tunnel right up over here. And what happens to be right here? This. And you see that tunnel here. One, two, three, directly three of these down. And what is on the sidewalk right there? Well, you look at that. It's a little freight elevator. And it lines up perfectly with the tunnel right there. And it actually makes sense that there's a couple of these because there were multiple businesses in this tiny building functioning at once. And I think, you know, the bar was more towards the front here and then the hotel was up here. Um, but I think there were even businesses towards the back there. So with multiple businesses, it makes sense that you'd have multiple entries because different businesses would be bringing in different inventory.